Mr. Coward, in the 20s, you were known for such things as good dry jokes and a silk dressing gown. What are your plans for the 1960s? More good dry jokes and another silk dressing gown. There have been great wits before. English theatre is littered with them, and always has been. And yet still Noel Coward's legacy stands out above them all. And this is simply because, while he was brilliantly deft, clever, and had a razor-sharp way with a one-liner, there was so much more to him than that. Noel Coward had a heart. His plays endure as much for their brittle brilliance as their genuine understanding of and compassion for the human condition. Born in suburban Teddington near London in the closing days of the 19th century, and named Noel because it was nearly Christmas, he was performing professionally by 10, and had become the lover and protege of painter Philip Streetfield by 14. His first play, a one-act satire called The Better Half, was produced in 1922, and he followed this by conquering just about every artistic avenue open to him. A playwright, actor, composer, lyricist, director, and novelist of unquestionable genius, his greatest creation remained himself. His work includes plays like Design for Living, Hay Fever, and Private Lives, and his most memorable songs range from the undeniably stirring London Pride to the deliciously camp Mad Dogs and Englishmen, and Don't Put Your Daughter on the Stage, Mrs. Worthington. Noel defined Englishness with his cigarette holder, elegantly tailored clothes and plummy tones. Unapologetically flamboyant, he nevertheless refused to confirm his sexuality publicly, saying endearingly, there is still a woman in Paddington Square who wants to marry me, and I don't want to disappoint her. Noel wrote, starred in, and co-directed the stirringly patriotic film In Which We Serve to boost public morale in 1942. But it later transpired he was doing much more for the war effort. His name was found to be in the Nazis' infamous Black Book, marked for execution had the Germans successfully invaded Britain. Although it was thought that this may have been because of his homosexuality, later it was revealed that while entertaining the troops, he was also involved in covert work for the Secret Service. It was a source of considerable frustration to him that he faced criticism for continuing with his glamorous lifestyle, while his secret war efforts had to remain just that. Papers proclaimed it, and the Savoy Hotel became a shrine, inundated by telephone calls, telegrams, gifts, camera, and newspaper men on the day when Noel Coward celebrated his 70th birthday. When Noel turned 70 in 1969, it was a story of national importance. While his career had hit a downturn in the 1950s, his 1960 play, Waiting in the Wings, set in a retired actress's rest home, was a critical hit, drawing comparisons with the work of Russian great Anton Chekhov. It led to a resurgence of interest in his earlier work, and his plays were restaged for a whole new generation. Noel was quaintly amused, referring to this period as Dad's Renaissance. But even through the hard times, his glittering circle of friends had adored him. If a man can be judged by the company he keeps, Noel Coward was clearly in a world of his own. His nearest and dearest included Gertrude Lawrence, Marlena Dietrich, the Olivia's, Larry and Vivian Lee, Judy Garland, Winston Churchill, and Ivor Novello, not to mention his rock-solid friendships with royals such as the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. Many of these friends made a visit to London to celebrate his birthday and rejoiced with him when he was knighted the following year. Noel finally succumbed to heart failure at the age of 73. Since then, his plays have been continually performed and filmed. His legacy is stronger than ever, and in 2006, London's Albury Theatre was renamed in his honour, and not before time.